right. Are we broadcasting live, Kennedy? I sure hope so. All right. And we're recording. It appears we are. Yes, we are. Yes. Yeah, so who knows? Who knows? Uh, careful with your comment. All right. Again, welcome to uh, this conversation hosted by Providence, a journal of Christianity and American foreign policy about the events of August and September 1945, the atomic blast at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and Japan's surrender on September 2nd. Our two distinguished speakers are our own Mark Lebecki of Providence, who is also attached to the Stockdale <coughs> Center at the Naval Academy in Annapolis, and Joseph Capizzi at Catholic University, who heads the Institute on Human Ecology. So uh, both Mark and Joe are regular contributors to Providence. They also are just for scholars and Christian ethicists with uh, strong opinions on the morality of uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, they are not in agreement on that issue, but I think that uh, we will start with their disagreements and then work our way to their agreements in terms of uh, the uh, dignity and decorum of the surrender and the uh, subsequent uh, seven decades of uh, peace and alliance between Japan and the United States. So uh, I should alert you that uh, before the pandemic, uh, Providence hosted a monthly social hour that typically included remarks plus drinks and food. We have decided to divorce the two so that from here on each month we will have a strictly social hour and then a more strictly uh, distinct event devoted to somber conversation as we are this evening. Which is this one? <laughs> <laughs> we haven't gotten trained. sober yet. <laughs> the sober conversation will also have food and drink. So the conversation, conversations in the future will be here in the office, and the more strictly social hours will be uh, off-site, typically in the uh, rooftop of the uh, Hyatt Hotel on the Pay Street, where we tried to have sometimes uh, abbreviated sober conversations, but that was very frustrating drinking and socializing and the traffic of K Street alone. So, Mark Lubecki, uh, perhaps we'll start with you and uh, your comments. Mark will speak for eight to 10 minutes. Joe Capese will speak for eight to 10 minutes. I may have uh, questions and comments for them for a few minutes afterwards, then we'll open it up to all of you. And we hope to conclude formally by 7.30, but of course all of you are welcome to linger uh, as long as you would like. So, Mark. All right. Thank you very much for. Can everybody in the back hear me okay? If I talk like this? Mark. Good for the sound check. Uh, I appreciate that. When we get, often when we talk about this, we talk really only about the atomic blast. And I'm maybe heartened that we're going to talk about the, the surrender and the peace that followed as well. Uh, partly because I, I like. I now have come to a point where I like to talk about this almost in reverse order. Uh, that it was the surrender and the kind of peace that we desired, uh, and here I had a caveat, the kind of peace that I think we ought to have desired, I'm not trying to get inside Truman's head, this isn't necessarily a defense of Truman's position, this is me looking retrospectively back and trying to analyze as a Christian ethicist whether or not the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki were moral. Um, I think for the most part, I align with the administration's decisions, uh, but not necessarily. Right. Uh, but because of the kind of peace we wanted, because of the surrender that we demanded, I'm going to argue that the atomic bombing was both uh, necessary and far more importantly, moral. Uh, and maybe more provocatively, to not have done so would have actually, given the options at hand, been immoral. All right. So if that doesn't provoke questions, then. Okay. Well, uh, the surrender, uh, it's, it's now well known and often criticized that we didn't simply want a surrender. Um, we wanted an unconditional surrender, no negotiations, no contracts. Um, our position was very simple. It was a demand that you surrender or die, all right? Is that justifiable? <coughs> Um, I argue that there is a, a, a line that can be drawn from Versailles, World War I, 
to Hiroshima. I think World War I taught us uh, that in some cases, uh, in order for any kind of durable peace to be possible, uh, one side or the other needs to know that they, in Sherman, in Sherman's words, in uh, Pershing's words, one side needs to know that they've been licked, right? They have to be sick of fighting. Uh, I think in World War I, the German people did not know that they had been licked. They had no reason to. They surrendered on enemy, enemy occupied territory. Their commanders told their troops we were standing down in enemy occupied territory. The German people, for the most part, never saw war visited upon their homeland. And this gave you know, rise to all sorts of things. I mean, betrayed, stab in the back, all of that. But also simply this notion that the fight has not been taken out of us. Uh, and really all World War I seemed to do is to, uh, or the peace of World War I, simply seemed to give us a pause to breed a new generation of boys to be killed. Um, so I think Versailles taught us that the enemy really does need to know that they have been licked, that a decisive victory uh, is a moral aspiration. Uh, and I, I think that plays a role here. In the case of Japan, moreover, I think the acceptance of defeat had to be accompanied by a Japanese renunciation of nationalistic militarism. And I'll get more into this in a moment. Um, I think it's only through this acceptance that durable peace had any real chance. So because we demanded an unconditional surrender, uh, the atomic bomb was both moral and necessary. Now, as, a, as a, an aside, the surrender could have been achieved in some other way. Uh, the land invasion, eventually we would have overthrown the Japanese if we invaded by land. Uh, there was a proposition on the table that would simply continue the naval blockade. Um, in, in other words, besiege the island of Japan, starve them out. That would have required continued Allied bombing of their, their factories, because they were producing kamikaze planes to continue harassing our Navy. Uh, but we could have done those two things, uh, and that would have brought about, more than likely, an unconditional surrender. Uh, so why not those things? Why the atomic bomb? Uh, there's many things to be said. The only thing I'll say for now is timing. Any other option other than the atomic bomb would have taken more time. And this is gonna become important in a moment. Uh, so not only did we demand unconditional surrender, but it was crucial that this unconditional surrender come about in the shortest possible time. Why? Again, many things to be said about this. I'll touch on one. Uh, we recently had a meeting uh, at which the historian Richard Frank spoke. Richard Frank's written a book called Downfall, The Tower of Skulls. He does a lot of analysis predicated on what he sees as a duty to count, as he says, all the dead. Now, from December 1944, January 1945 onward, Richard Frank estimates that approximately 8,000 civilians, innocent non-combatants, died under Japanese occupation every single day. All right? That's a low-ball estimate, so about 240,000 innocent non-combatants every day. This is somewhat incidental, but that already in one month eclipses the total dead in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. All right, I don't want to get into a, a numbers game necessarily, but that's interesting. Uh, given the morally appropriate demand for unconditional surrender in the shortest possible amount of time, I argue that the atomic bombing was militarily necessary and it was proportional. A proportionalism, or proportionality is a just war constraint, I think is often misunderstood. Sometimes it's meant simply to say that if you do something with an incredible amount of destructive power, that's disproportionate. But disproportionate, or proportionality, has to be measured as a good against two other measures. So you measure the good to be achieved against two measures of harm. Uh, of course, the harm that the action will itself entail, but also, importantly, the harms that will come about from not doing the particular action in question. So if we want to gauge the proportionality of the atomic bomb, you weigh both the measure of harm that the atomic bomb will do, and you also weigh, it's a moral requirement, to weigh the harms that will come from not doing the atomic bomb. So you can turn to your other options, all right? <coughs> Um, 
I've already touched on the argument that all the other options uh, to induce Japanese surrender would have taken time and would have resulted in vastly greater uh, casualties among innocent non-combatants under Japanese occupation. Just to stress the point a little bit, the land invasion uh, was proposed for November of 1945, so that would have been, what, two, three months after the atomic bombing. We multiply two or three months by 240,000, it starts to get ghastly. The attack on the main island of Japan wasn't going to happen until May of 1946, so that's another eight months, right? So, you know, again, the counting of all the dead becomes a fairly grisly thing. Um, but let's not turn only uh, to those under Japanese occupation, but to the Japanese themselves, right? So the naval blockade, starting up the Japanese, would have been gaslighting. One Japanese historian plots the death toll to be expected from that, it's something like 20 million Japanese. Again, a combination of combatants, but also missing non-combatants. Uh, the land invasion of Japan, uh, I think indisputably, would have resulted in more innocent non-combatant death than occurred in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, you know, that's a hy hypothetical, right? But you can turn to Okinawa, and the death toll on Okinawa as an example of the kind of ferocity with which the Japanese would have fought to preserve their homeland. Okinawa was ghastly. Um, and one general cautioned Truman that they could expect, you know, I think it was dozens of bloody Okinawans should they launch the land invasion. Right, so it wasn't just innocent non-combatants under Japanese lands, the Japanese themselves. So my sort of provocative um, opening salvo for this kind of argument is very often to say that if you wanted to save lives, both innocent and non-combatant, you drop that bomb. To me, that seems indisputable. It doesn't resolve the question at hand, but that fact, I think, is indisputable. All right, uh, last point on this. The atomic bomb was, the atomic bombing itself was necessary uh, because though the Japanese knew that they were defeated, uh, they were not willing to surrender. So Richard Frank and others make the argument that from the summer of 1944 onward, it was plain to the Japanese that they had lost the war. They knew it. They were defeated. They knew they were defeated. That does not translate into a willingness to surrender. Um, now that the archives are open, we have all sorts of uh, data on the intelligence intercepts from the MAGIC program, the ULTRA program onward. We know from the communications between the Japanese foreign minister and the representative, the ambassador in Moscow, uh, that the Japanese were nowhere close to surrender. Um, a little bit of background on this, the, the War Council in Japan, known as the Big Six, uh, had to make a unanimous decision about really any major decision uh, before the, the, the empire would follow its dictates. Um, from 1944 onward, the magic intercepts tell us that they were at best split on the decision of whether or not to surrender. It was three to three. Uh, without the unan unanimity, uh, they could not produce a surrender. Uh, we can get into this Q&A, but there's the idea that, oh, all they were holding out for was the preservation of the emperor. Um, nowhere in the magic intercepts does that appear to be the case. Um, the big six, they wanted territorial um, concessions. Uh, they wanted no war crimes, or if there were crime, were war crime tribunals, and we would administer them ourselves. If there's a military stand down, we will oversee that. There will be no occupation. These demands shifted, but they were never only about the preservation of the emperor. And then as an aside, I would say, even if it were only about the preservation of the emperor, uh, my question is, why on God's green earth would we necessarily, out of hand, allow um, the maintenance of the imperial system. Uh, the emperor himself uh, you know, was a part of the war machine. If you look from, it goes all the way back to 1868, when uh, people want to say William Perry, that means you're refrigerated, right? So I <laughs> Matthew Perry, and I just dated myself there probably. Um, but Commodore Matthew Perry in 1868 went to the Japanese harbor. Um, there began the relationship between the Japanese and the West. And the Japanese had a question at hand of how do we allow the West to come in without us losing who we are? Uh, and they did many things to preserve this. It's an important question. But they ended up fusing Shintoism and nationalism with, uh, with Bushido and 
created a way of being nationalistic while still bringing in Western technologies. Uh, they began uh, almost an imperial fetish where the emperor became a deity connected all the way back to the sun god from early Japan. Uh, all of this, this new Bushido code, predicated on loyalty and self-sacrifice. And all of this, up into 1945, uh, you know, had ghastly consequences. And the recognition was that this has to be driven out of the Japanese people if we're to have any kind of a durable peace. They need to know they've been licked. Um, they need to be tired of fighting. We could get uh, here, I, I suspect, though I don't know if it's entirely true, that we probably agree on most of these facts. But at the end of the day, this is going to come down to a question of how do we, what does moral action look like? Despite the facts or in light of the facts, how do you behave morally in the world? And we can get into some of that. I'm going to skip it because I just want to talk about um, the history. Uh, and I'm going to try to conclude because I'm sure I'm probably going to stop time. All right. Um, I want to jump to the occupation. MacArthur, General MacArthur, uh, was responsible for the occupation of Japan. <clears throat> he had a strategy of not only military disarmament, but moral and psychological disarmament as well. And I've already touched on this a little bit. This moral and psychological disarmament was balanced by a positive project of institutional, institutional reforms. But MacArthur was clear that the Japanese themselves could make no demands. They were defeated people. They had to know that they were defeated people. Uh, one historian wrote it like this. MacArthur's strategy was that the Japanese had to experience a defeat so shattering, a surrender so unconditional, a disgrace of militarism so complete, and to experience the misery of their holy war at so personal a level that reconstruction would be recognized as involving much more than bro fixing broken buildings. It would mean rethinking what it means to speak of a good life and a good society. And the kind of surrender we demanded of them, and then the occupation we enforced upon them, brought this about. Um, in, in ways shocking, given today's news cycle, uh, I think the, the American administration of post-war Japan was remarkably nuanced, culturally savvy, strategically um, capable. Uh, we were very careful to distinguish state Shintoism from personal Shintoism. Um, we allowed the personal fidelity to their, their faith to continue, but we uprooted it from the education system. Um, you know, we, we gave them essentially a new constitution that I think it's correct to say they have never since changed. Um, but even from the beginning, they needed to know that nothing was owed to them. This was MacArthur's stance. And then hard on the heels of that, an amazing amount of aid came pouring into the country. Uh, but again, as one of, and, and this was essential because in January, the rice crop failed and had the war continued, uh, the crisis in Japan, uh, just in terms of food supply, would have been ghastly. Um, we brought in rice, we brought in food, we fed and rebuilt. Japan. But as one observer said, uh, this the, the peace that we now enjoy with Japan first came about from the dropping of napalm and atom bombs, not rice. Um, I'll close with just an anecdote. Uh, just eight years after the end of World War II, uh, Theodor Geisel, also known as Dr. Seuss, visited Japan. <clears throat> and he met with a whole bunch of Japanese school children. And he asked the Japanese school children to draw pictures of what they wanted to be when they grew up. And the Japanese school children, eight years after World War II, um, eight years after no longer being in a school system, which drove them toward emperor worship, self-sacrifice for the good of the emperor, and the acquisition of territories worthy of such an empire, eight years after all of that, the Japanese children drew pictures of doctors and statesmen and teachers wrestlers, right? Only one student drew a picture of a soldier. And he wanted to be General MacArthur. <laughs> I think that's related to the atomic bomb. All right, great, thank you. Um, thank you, Mark, for inviting me to be here. Um, 
I have a, like add the comments, but I'm gonna basically scrap them and just respond to uh, more or less what I heard. Um, and probably because I think that'll be more fun, uh, you know, for you to hear us engage some of these things. Uh, and because mm -hmm. they, uh, Mark's comments, I think, are quite provocative and sort of get to the punchline, I think they're largely wrong. Um, so, uh, <laughs> uh, and, right, and, so, in a way, like a, the first, the first question would be something like, um, "What is the relationship of the facts right, to thinking through moral questions?" And if you, you may have seen, I wrote a piece on, in public discourse that was on this in, in a way that was responsive to these kinds of arguments. That if you just line up certain kinds of facts, or what you take to be facts, right? That they're not the Japanese are not really ready to surrender. Uh, that. Uh, that they were a particular kind of fighting people. Uh, and that, uh, you know, Mark said, you count up all the other numbers, uh, that once you add those things up and you look at them, you realize, well, geez, we're gonna have to drop a bomb. We're gonna have to do something that seems particularly horrific, at least in the course of human history, right? Unprecedented uh, to that point. And, and as Mark knows already, and in a way, like there's not really been any sort of moral, pro there's not been any progress intellectually on this kind of question. For many of us, that's just not how you do moral analysis, right? That there are certain kinds of things that you can't do, even if I see all of these facts, right? Um, we still can't do certain things that we might want to do, that we might think are necessary to do, uh, and so on. So, I mean, that's one area I think where we just, Kind of strongly disagree. I want to make a point about what I think Mark Mark's analysis does well, um, and where we and where we agree, and that is he's doing what, what seems to me like he's making a careful attempt to keep politics and war connected, and this is something that I think is deeply sort of embedded in the the just war theory of the Catholic you know version or you know Protestant version 2.0 or whatever. Right, like um, it's uh, right, like with the original. Um, so uh, that from the, our perspective, war waging is an extension of political activity. Another way to put it is, it's not a departure from politics. Right, so war needs to serve the goods that are served by political activity, and therefore also it needs to be bound by. Um, the morality that binds political activity. And you're all probably thinking, well, geez, we don't typically use, um, you know, you know, bombers, um, you know, when we do, when we try to achieve domestic political aims, unless you're Mayor, Mayor Wilson good in Philadelphia or something, <laughs> right? But that's, that's an old example, right? That maybe proves the point. Um, uh, and, and that while it's true, right, we don't, what we can do, um, and I think we all recognize we can do, is we can take human lives in the pursuit of some political goods, even domestically. And you don't even have to think about capital punishment, right? Because that's you know, its own contested thing and so on, and it's often not necessary, right, in order to preserve you know, uh, the good of peace in a, in a society once you've apprehended somebody. But just think of rioting, right? Um, we recognize that sometimes in riots, if they're of you know, a severe enough kind, right, it, countries are within their rights in using lethal force against rioters who are bringing force against the state, right? Um, that's a common uh, view in politics that domestically you can do this, and by analogy, and it's a common analogy that's made in just war analysis, or really probably in any kind of political analysis, that's the kind of thing that happens internationally or among, right, among states when they have certain kinds of disagreements that recognize that they can bring force against each other in order to vindicate um, some wrong. But the key here is that a wrong is done, right? That somebody is doing something that is in fact wrong, it's been judged as wrong by those who are in political authority, and now political authority is acting in a manner um, to, to right that wrong or to secure goods against that wrong. So I, I, I like that, Ma that Mark is connected the waging of the war, right? The, going to the war and so on to political goals that he's identifying, right? the good of the peace that comes as a consequence of Japanese surrender and so on. The, the problem from my perspective, right, and not merely my perspective, is 
not simply that, of course, he's going to justify something that is immoral uh, in you know, classical morality, right, which is the intentional killing of innocent people as a means to securing that end right, of peace. It's not merely that. That's, in a sense, more symptomatic. right? It's that he does so by defining facts in, in very sort of ironclad ways when they're, they're not clearly facts, right? Um, that they're, they're, they're speculative, right? So the peace that comes as a consequence of what happens could only have happened if we dropped the bomb. Well, that doesn't seem to me to be a fact, right? That seems to be a speculation about what happens, you know, as, again, once you assume certain kinds of things are in motion. One key element of his assumption, and, and he was clear about this, which is, you know, again, to his credit, is the language of unconditional surrender, right? That we have to force the Japanese into an unconditional surrender. It's unclear why we have to do that, right? Um, but nonetheless, that is a commitment that Mark makes. And he, and he, say, he gives us this wonderful language that um, we, you know, the Japanese have to be humiliated. They have to be humiliated. You know, it seems to be like it's a fair question. They'd say the militarists have to be humiliated. Um, I, 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 well, I, maybe you did. I don't know. Um, I, I wrote down Japanese have to be humiliated. Um, so they have to be humiliated. They needed to know they could make no demands, right? So there's no room, right, for any concessions, which again we think of as kind of typical to politics, right? I mean, one of the other aspects of politics is that there is give and take, there is negotiation, right? And it's pretty clear that in this case, Mark and those who argued this way have excluded that as a possibility. We're just going to assume that the way forward is, you know, presupposes unconditional surrender, their humiliation in a way that was not the case in Germany, you know, in, you know as a, um, after the First World War, um, which again is a way of reading what happens after the First World War and then reading that onto uh, the Japanese situation and then saying that because of that fact and this fact, right now we can do nothing other than humiliate these people, you know, completely um, demoralize them to the point, I think you said morally defeated and other, I can't remember what the other uh, the term yeah, was. Psychologically. Right, psychologically and morally defeat them. Well, these to me seem contrary. Um, to the kinds of goods that ought to be pursued by those who are engaging in negotiations, engaging in the pursuit of peace with a partner. The Japanese remain a partner um, in, ought to remain a partner in this process of pursuing a peace. And, and, and it's clear that from this perspective, that is not the case. Once you have committed to that, then you've more or less committed yourself to a position where you could do anything you wanted to, to humiliate them, to demoralize them, to psychologically defeat them, and so on. So you can't allow them to go on, I think Mark said, uh, you know, with their emperor worship, but you can allow us to impose conditions on them that lead to them worshiping MacArthur, right, or lead to them, you know, you know, revering certain kinds of, you know, goods of ours. Why that's the case, again, why we're backing in ourselves and them into these positions is not clear. Why we accept those as facts is not clear. And that's why I think, generally speaking, just war analysis has refused to condone unconditional surrender because it backs you, again, into situations where you imagine, or you, or you cut off the imaginative possibilities that can remain in place that would allow you to make peace with an adversary, right, who also has peace as its own good, right? This peace is a, a, a arrangement of order between peoples, right? And that's, um, anyway, so these are my concerns with that kind of analysis, that they, they, they accept certain things as facts that are not clearly facts. Um, and there, there, there remain lots of disputes about elements of, of Marx's account or the history about you know, for instance, how the Russians may have affected the outcome and so on, but I know Mark and I probably disagree about that. Uh, but right, there, there remain 
lots of disputes about these kinds of things, but they're accepted as facts in order to vindicate what is essentially ultimately a consequential analysis, right? If we add up the numbers, right, if we add up all the numbers, including numbers for which we are not responsible, right, you know, when somebody is doing some harm to somebody else, right, now that counts, you know, on the ledger sheet against us if we don't act in a timely way, right? Why that's the case is unclear, right? But if we add up all these numbers, and even I think one, at one time, I can't remember if it was Mark or somebody else, projected forward. They started counting all of the missing people that would have been born, right, as a consequence of not having been killed, right? If, was it you? I can't remember. I right, but, but it, maybe it was at the, you know, the conversation we were having, right? All of these numbers are now going to be counted up you know, as part of an analysis. So even though we're told the numbers don't matter, they clearly do matter, right? They do matter because they're used to justify doing something that, generally speaking, classical morality agrees is wrong, intentionally killing people who are innocent. Um, I'll stop there. Uh, you know, I, I think there's a lot more we can you know, discuss, but I just wanted to respond, you know, to what Mark brought to the table today. If I could just add two two points, I had three. I completely forgot what the first, second, or third one was. Of maybe clarification, um, and the first one is already beginning to fall away. So here, here so we it's go. So down to one. Um, <laughs> at least down to just the one. But maybe maybe the other one will come back. Um, oh no, two 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 things. Another one's back. The first is this. The first one's back. Um, I do do this dogmatically, right? These are the facts. Um, and I can see happily that we don't have omniscience. We didn't have omniscience in 1945, we don't have it now. Um, but I do assert, and this is self-evident, that the best we can do at any one moment is to marshal the facts as we can understand them, or the, the, the details as we can comprehend them, uh, and to respond to those, always with the caveat that, yeah, sure, maybe because of the contingencies of history, we're wrong about this, but when we use reason, authority, or experience um, as carefully as possible, we give ourselves the best chance of making a moral choice. Um, and I would argue, from Okinawa, uh, Saipan, Iwo Jima, the Japanese taught us um, how the Japanese will fight on the home. Um, from knowing that they were defeated from 1944 onward, and yet not accepting the idea of surrender. Unconditional. Um, what's that? Unconditional. Unconditional. Uh, sir, uh, the, the surrender that was being proposed um, had to be unacceptable. Territorial acquisitions and disputed and lands that they had conquered. You know, I don't know. We can get into those facts. I don't want to get totally central. I just want to say that. Um, sorry, that is not um, Of course, we have totally rock easy. solid facts, but we do the best we can with the information at hand. That's the, the first step of Christian ethics is to try to get as accurate a description of the facts on the ground as you can, and then to begin responding to them. Because of those, because of reason, authority, and experience, I think we have good reasons to think what I've described as facts were in fact facts. The second thing is I don't mean to suggest that we could therefore do anything to bring about unconditional surrender, and my qualification isn't going to, to heal the breach. Um, we could only do things that were constrained uh, by just cause, right attention, military necessity, discrimination and proportionality. And I think the atomic bomb fit that bill. Uh, I can't remember what so it's constrained by discrimination? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Which is an expansion of the idea of discrimination. It's a, you said it's an expansion of the idea of discrimination. It, it's an abuse of the idea of discrimination. Oh, oh, Mark, you wanted to ask questions first, I think? There are hands behind you. Well, let's just go straight to uh, the audience. Who has a question? The okay. who was shaking his head at everything I said. <laughs> <laughs> Caleb? Okay. So, uh, I, I, I didn't hear Mark assert as fact that it was unconditional surrender that led to the peace that we've had with Japan, but I think it's pretty reasonable speculation. I mean, in the all the myriad conflicts that we've had since the end of the Civil War, only two of them have really ended it in a situation of basically unconditional surrender, and only two have really ended in unambiguous victory, the Civil War and World War II. So I don't think that was totally unreasonable speculation, but that's you know, a separate conversation. Um, but when you talk about unconditional surrender, 
surrender mean something that's at odds with like, traditional morality? I think it's a good to say. Isn't that situational? Like, doesn't that depend on who is imposing uh, those conditions or lack thereof? I mean, I could see that being immoral if the Soviet Union gave it to Japan uh, that they could not have any negotiation or conditions. But it's not if it was the United States. And it wasn't that the Japanese were first carpet. In fact, it was the opposite. We were liberated from a death cult where they were worshiping a tyrant. And we were freeing them to be in a situation where they could actually be peaceful partners with us that they could not have been had we allowed them to negotiate with us like while they were still under the like shackles of a tyrannical death cult that they were in. I, it seems to me that it would have been at odds with traditional morality to have allowed them to remain in such a state. Yeah, um, look, I, I so, the, so obviously you're like importing as facts certain kinds of claims, right? The, the traditional death cult, right? They, they pledged 100 million deaths of honor. That sounds like a pretty, and, like, and they made a song death death. Well, well, but, but, but that's not speculative. But many of them loved their emperor, right? Many of them revered their emperor. Right. I mean, this is you're, you're, right, we're talking about. Hence um, the cult part. Of it. Well, uh, well, it seems it's, it's, it's they a, worshipped him. He was the sun god. People worship different things, right? Um, this is this it's a it's a powerful claim, right? Um, and you know, arguably an arrogant claim in, in to override, right, the the Japanese people's own self understanding of their relationship with their emperor, right? So. I just think we, we have to be we have to be chastened about the kinds of claims that we make on behalf of other cultures, right? So but that's how they described it. That's that's not some Western. They described it as we're shackled by our emperor. They, they described that as worshiping him. I understand, that, right? right? I mean, I understand that they're not the first. They're not the first people to worship another person, right? Or to worship particular people as, or to revere them as their leaders and so on, right? I don't. I'm sort of going to say they're like hypnotized by, or you know, in an occult, an entire people for over a century, right? As it, that seems arrogant, and it, and that's the, the kind of arrogance, um, and that oh, it's the kind of arrogance I think that fuels into a certain understanding, which I, I think relates to the common, you know, the question about discrimination, that they're not innocent, right? That these people are not innocent because they have this particular regard for this emperor that inclines them to you know, fight differently, that inclines them to behave differently uh, than Americans do or would, right? Um, so, No, I, I actually view them uh, perhaps even more innocently than you do, um, but I think that dropping the bomb on them was a tragic action that their emperor necessitated, and that those deaths are at the hands of the emperor, and unfortunately, like, I, you know that was that was his responsibility. Right. I, uh, I, I mean, I, liberating someone from a cult who was obliging them to fight to death was like uh, I, I, I don't understand what moral analysis puts puts responsibility for those deaths on the hands of those liberators. It would would put the hands up, but the responsibility for the deaths on the people who dropped the bombs on. Yes. In terms of action analysis. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's where, again, I think we would depart, right? That, that what that presupposes is that we were, by necessity, forced into doing something. We were not agents. We were not, we were not free agents as Americans, right? We, we did not act freely in choosing to do this. Uh, and you're describing them as innocent, right? Um, and so in killing them, this was just a, a kind of historical necessity, which is, you know, I think how... Um, you know, which is what I reacted to in my essay, and I think what Mark um, has in the past, you know, argued, right? That it was a kind of, you know, tragic situation, as you put it. But that's not how I think, again, classical morality would understand our actions. We, we are free, right? We could have chosen other than to do that, right? We could have fought differently. We could have made different kinds of demands in terms of the surrender, right? Yeah. Uh, right. We could have done other things. These are things that. As we said the last time we talked, you know, we're talking about this that Niebuhr and others, right? Other people said, right? There were other alternatives than to do this. So we chose, right? We chose to do this, and we can provide a rationale for why we chose to do this. 
but we chose out of freedom to do it, right? And when you choose out of freedom to kill innocent people, uh, right, intentionally to kill innocent people, right? Right. right? right, but when you choose intentionally to kill innocent people, you, you've chosen murder as a means to certain ends. So all right, uh, next question. Yeah. You said intentionally a number of times, and maybe I'm looking at it through too much of a legal lens. Right. I would argue it's knowing rather than intentional. I guess, do you agree with that distinction? And if you do, and it's not just workmanship on my part, wouldn't continuing the land invasion or the siege or whatever also lead to knowing, if not intentionalness? We knew it was going to happen. We didn't intend for that to happen. There's a natural and logical consequence of it, but not something we hoped right. or wanted to happen. Right. Look, so the distinction between knowing um, that something is going to be the outcome of your action, right, and intending something as the outcome of your action is also classic morality, right? I agree. There's a distinction to be made between knowing something is going to happen as a consequence of my action or knowing two things, or two or more things, will happen as a consequence of my action, and then also saying that I intend one of those things, but I don't intend this other outcome, right? So, um, I mean, you know, I like to talk about punishment, right? So, you know, in punishment, right, I, I intend something. I can intend to send my child, you know, uh, to bed without dinner, right? As a punishment, and I'm doing this in order to punish them. I know, as a consequence of, the, of that, it's going to bring suffering on them, right? Or it's going to cause my um, son, you know, maybe even I know with a certain kind of parental confidence, right, that my son will react in a particular way, right? He'll start screaming and break a toy or something like this. Um, so, which of those things can I say I intended, right, as an act? as a consequence of my action. I didn't intend even something I, I knew was going to happen, right? He's gonna break his toy, or he's gonna yell at me, right? Use a bad word. Even though I had a really good sense that this was gonna happen, I intended to punish him. I intended to cause the suffering associated with punishment. Um, so absolutely, right, that, that's a distinction that's critical to all of our analysis, right? Uh, now if I beat my child, right, if I punish my child, right, and I, and I beat him, um, and, you know, and and I hurt it, right? Uh, you know, I, I, I hit him hard enough that I hurt it. And afterwards, I said, look, I knew it was gonna hit him, right? But I didn't intend, right? I didn't really intend to hurt him. And you, you could say to me, well, Joe, like, look, you hit a kid like that, you're gonna hurt him. You know, he's 12, you're whatever you are, right? Um, <laughs> right, you're gonna hurt him, right? You can't tell me, right, that you didn't intend this. I mean, that can happen, right? Like. Where even though I choose an action and do something, right, that I think, right, I'm, I'm not intended to an outcome, somebody else can say, well, actually, you know, you did, you know, you did intend it. I can tell, who's the, there was a football player, right, who, you know, beat his child a, a few years back, a few years back, what was that? Right, right, and right, the law basically said to him, you know, you, you know, because I think Peterson made, made, made the claim, look, it was punishment, right, I was just, I was just punishing my child, I was intending to punish him, I'm not responsible for, you know, I didn't mean to, right? I heard him, and the law basically made a judgment, well, no, you did, like, you can't, right? So we can acknowledge that that, that that can be true, too, right? And so where Mark and I depart, right, I think, is in seeing a situation like this, right, where, and I don't know which part of the intentionality and knowing or just, you know, where the disagreement comes, but as Ramsey said, right, you can't drop the bombs, right, and withhold your intention. When you're dropping an atomic weapon on a city, right, on Nagasaki, um, you're intending to kill the innocent people. Right? You don't merely know that you're gonna kill the innocent people. You're intending to kill the innocent people at that point. And how do we know that? Well, because you didn't do other things you might have been able to do, right? There's something about this weapon, there's something about, right, um, the options that you that you allowed yourself to consider, that you removed, right, and you, you jumped in with, and we, we really can't adequately say that you didn't intend this. And I, I'm on the side of those who think it's crystal clear that we intended to kill innocent people, in part to do the kinds of things Mark said, to demoralize them, to humiliate them, right, to psychologically damage them, right? And, and obviously it has an effect. This is not like dropping firebombs, which are also morally problematic, right? where people can run to air shelters and so on. This is bomb hits and right, everything gets leveled relatively instantaneously. Um, it's, it's a different thing than that, which also anyway is hard to argue wasn't 
intend to do, right, be a different kind of war waging than we were doing earlier in the war, or than anybody was doing earlier in the war. We weren't the only ones doing these things. Um, so I think, I think it's, it's pretty clear that that is a situation where not merely did we know that we're going to kill innocents, right, which we knew in other places, um, we intended to kill innocents. And, and again, along the lines that fit Mark's analysis, we did it because we wanted to, I can't remember the kinds of things you said, but we wanted to, we want to lick them. We wanted to lick them. We want them to know they're licked, right, and not merely licked, but they're psychologically hobbled by this conflict. And to that extent, maybe that was, maybe that, maybe that did happen. Or maybe that was, but yeah, sorry. No, it's a long response. Yeah. Thank you. It's at the risk of putting words in your mouth, and please. I hate to use the term given the first number of casualties. <laughs> but I, I take it you don't view the many, many civilian deaths from the bombings as mere collateral damage, and you think it was, I guess, part of the strategy, part of the intent to humiliate and devastate by killing civilians. That's right. Right. So you can distinguish that kind of bombing at that point in the war. Again, either either the fire bombing or the atomic bombing. At that point in the war, we are actually trying to kill civilians, right? Because we're trying to bring about the end of the war in a timely way and also a sufficiently demoralizing way, or however you want to describe it. So their their deaths are actually part of the means towards these ends that you're pursuing. That's right. Collateral damage would be like you know we're going to bomb, you know. Uh, Shipyard, right, and we're going to send, you know, whatever, we're, you know, by ever, whatever means of bombing it, and but we also factor into it that some, right, the bombs are imprecise, and some of them are going to go the wrong way, or we can't see as well as we can, or whatever. Right? You're going to factor into it a certain percentage of of deaths that you're going to view it from the from the perspective of proportionality. How many of those kinds of deaths, right, before we say it's disproportionate, right? So yeah, I think. Yes. We just, if, if I could just touch on a couple Sorry. of things. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <clears throat> um, right, because we disagree on this. We, we, we do. Um, there's all sorts of things that I want to say, but uh, j just a couple things. Like, you know, there is at one point we had whittled down the target list to about 10 different cities. And Hiroshima and Nagasaki were never at any point the most densely populated. So it's a, we also at least have to say we weren't simply out to kill as many innocent non-combatants as possible, because we could have hit a bigger city. Um, Hiroshima was uh, chosen in part uh, because the city of, was essentially untouched from conventional bombing. And for a demonstration blast to be effective, we wanted to level a city, which is going to be full of people, yes. But we were targeting an untouched city so as to best demonstrate the destructive nature of the bomb, so as to best drive home the fact that we do not have to invade you. So your plan of having us invade and fighting so ferociously that we will eventually weary of the bloodletting and sue for terms more acceptable to you is obsolete. Um, so a lot of people who agree with me say, oh, is it just, you know, it was a land invasion or the atomic bombing. Make no mistake, we never had to invade Japan. We could have stood offshore with the naval blockade, we could have conventionally bombed them into oblivion, could have done other things. I don't, I, I don't know why this idea keeps carrying forward. We did not have to invade. Um, we dropped leaflets on crowded cities saying, look, cities are targetable. Um, I don't know where we expected the people to go, right? So, you know, that's a little bit disingenuous, but, you know, there is that. Um, and, it, and it does matter to a degree, but I don't want to rest on this, um, that Hiroshima was the home to the Second Army. The Second Army, one of their express purposes uh, was to manage the Ketsugo program, the insurgency. So the universal conscription that the emperor of Japan forced upon all women and men from, I can't remember the exact ages, but early teens to somewhere in the middle of the so I would have been, so you would have been safe while they were in the world. Um, there was a universal conscription. And the second army stationed at Hiroshima um, was in charge of that. So there was a viable military target. That's a little bit of, um, a lot of people say, oh, it's a legitimate military target. It's okay, but you know, that's, that's pushing the parameters of that. Um, I and want to look Nagasaki. at something. And Nagasaki is more problematic. My, I, a, lot, a lot of my stuff stops on Hiroshima. Um, I have questions about Nagasaki. At the end of the day, I still say, fine, you should have done it. I think it's a little bit more problematic. Um, 
but I, but I do think this question of intentionality also has a lot to do, uh, not just with intention, like we know these people will die, and we mean it, but is there also, Nigel Bigger does this, and I know a lot of people don't like it, but you can even split intention into those things that you desire in and of themselves. Um, and I think at no point would it be right to say you desire in and of itself the annihilation of the people of Hiroshima. Um, we knew it was gonna happen. Um, maybe it was salutary that along with the city, we wiped out you know, 80,000 human beings in a flash. Um, it drove home the shock and awe. Um, you know, that, that broke the, 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 the will of the Japanese uh, in the fighting. Uh, but I think it's important to say, even after Nagasaki, the, the, the big six was split three to three, they still did not want to give up after Nagasaki, which was after Hiroshima, after Nagasaki, and after the Soviets had declared war. The big six were still split, and the emperor had to break the tie. Um, I think all that, all that factors in. Before we get to the concluding remarks, does anyone want to try to take down Mark Levecki? <laughs> and, and this guy did have his hand up for a while. So maybe take two more. Uh, my original question was actually similar to his. Uh, well, I had two, and yeah. so I'll skip that one. The other one is actually is on the other side, and that is um, the one thing I heard you kind of say maybe is a fact to you. I'm sorry, what's your name? Mark yeah. and Joe. Mark. This is Mark. Mark. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> It's true we were trying to effectuate their surrender. I buy that. But it seemed to me the way we were talking about it was sort of more like, okay, this we knew if we did this, we were going to surrender. I mean, it wasn't inevitable that it was going to work, right? I mean, they still could have not. We could have killed you know, however many hundred, you know, hundred thousand people, and they still not surrender. And we have to do everything else. Three to three on the night of October, August night. Yeah, and, and so, and, and it was really a very odd situation. It seems to me that he incredibly good outcome we had that is perhaps historically unprecedented insofar as, in a sense, we made their god cry for them. Um, does the fact that it wasn't inevitable that the god was going to cry for them, how much does that change your calculus that you didn't know it was going to work and that you really, in one sense, kind of had an audience of one person and what you were trying to do? It's a great question. Um, maybe I didn't say this, so what I'll, what I'll say is, I think the atomic bomb uh, had the best chance of bringing about the unconditional surrender in the short a time as possible. It had the best chance of doing that. No guarantees. Um, and yes, maybe my, calculus, my calculus doesn't change at all. Um, I think no other option would have brought, had any chance bringing about, I mean, we've been working on it since 1944, Potsdam forward, uh, working on surrender from, you know, long out. So this had the best chance, and given the costs of uh, not having a timely and quick surrender, my calculus doesn't change. In conclusion, and I'm sorry, is there another question? Yeah. Oh, three well, lots of questions. <laughs> well, that's that's not, not fair at that point. The fellow with the open collar. Oh, uh, yeah, Mark. Um, so I'll, I'll give a shout out to the pro bomb side. Um, so two questions. First, I'm guessing, you, or how would you answer the Soviet question? I've, I've been told confidently by um, an academic historian that you know that the thing that influenced Japan to surrender to the U.S. was the you know the um, the of the Soviets. Uh, but the second thing, also vaguely related to the Soviets, but with just war in particular, is right intent is an important aspect of dropping the bomb as part of the justification we were aiming for the surrender. But there are other factors that we know that existed behind the motivation of the dropping of the bomb. One being, I mean, you couldn't use it in Germany anymore. There's a bit of institutional inertia of spending however many millions of dollars, a billion dollars we spent. We have this weapon. We have to find out what it does before it's too late. And second, you know, we want to name an example to the Soviets. Those are two other factors that were in the water. So I guess my, my question is, what degree of influence with those corrupting intentions? At what point does it concern you that the bomb is no longer justified if those are encroaching on the correct intention of? So if I thought that the reason you dropped it was to fire the first shot of the Cold War, it would have been ghastly and inhumane and unhelpful. We 
should have done. But I, I, I don't think the historic record and the pushback against uh, Apple World Paralytics, I can't remember his name, but all those guys, I think the historic record pushing against that is so strong that it's, to, to my mind, it's absolutely convincing. Um, I find it interesting uh, that the Emperor of Japan in his radio address never mentioned the entry of the Soviet Union into his decision to surrender. He blamed the surrender on, and I can't remember the exact language, but on the enemy having a tool or a device or a weapon, maybe, that we can do nothing against. He never mentioned the entry of the Soviet Union. Um, did it help? I'm sure it helped. I mean, it was certainly a one-two punch, but I think what, what, how it helped the most was because the Japanese were hoping that the Soviets would be willing to broker some sort of a negotiated peace. That's the magic intercepts between the Japanese foreign minister and the, the, the ambassador, Japanese ambassador in Moscow was all predicated on that. Like, what can we get them to agree to? Um, and some historians even say the Japanese you know, carried a vague hope that maybe the Soviets would join their side. Right, so I, I, I think that was the shock, that you know, the last grasp we have, that broker a negotiated peace so that we can have some of the terms that are dear to us has just been lost. But the emperor never mentions the entry of the Soviet Union into his declaration to the people of Japan that we've lost. And I think that's telling. Because we, as far as I know, and I've seen no suggestion otherwise, we have no ability to influence his radio address whatsoever. Um, So, as you say, if that entered into our calculus, it would, it would make it unjust, but um, our use of the bomb. But sh what, shouldn't we have also considered the moral cost of using it in the future? I'm not, I, so, so I, I, it, it's a, a, the, the points that you made and pointed out, and the way you said it would have been immoral immoral to use it, should we have at least considered the what ifs moving into foreign policy beyond the war, or just the fact that we were simply looking to end the war meant that it was moral and we didn't have to consider post-1945? Sure. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure I get the, the weight of the question, but for sure, we should always consider the secondary um, effects of anything we do, uh, for certain. I don't know what else to say beyond that, but but yeah, that should factor into the calculus. If I if I punch Joe now for whatever he just did, you know, what does what does that do to actions in the future? Sure. Well, I think what kind of I, I, I take the force of the question to be something like um, th there's a calculation being made here, right? And the calculation you're doing again, like I said, what's good about it to me is that it's it's striving to keep connected political outcomes. Right? Political lens, a legitimate political lens to the activity of the war, right? Uh, but where it departs from what I think is classical, you know, morality is that it allows to be calculated into this the doing of things that you understand to be immoral as kind of a priori, right? And and in order to do the kind of analysis analysis you're doing to allow you to do that, override these moral a priori, so you're, you're kind of entering into the calculation a lot of things, right? Things that I, you know, you, you, that I pointed out, you said were facts that I think are, again, are questionable. So it's, again, whether, in fact, the uh, emperor will, will surrender as a consequence of it. The, the shape or the response of the Japanese people to it, um, the, the consequences for the coming conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union at that point. Should that have been should that have been also factored into this or not? And if it had been, in what way might it have affected the calculation you're making? And that's part of the difficulty, right, for analyses that that allow you to sort of undo certain moral commitments because of calculation is that it becomes very difficult to understand where when we stop. When we stop calculating, right? And as I said, I think it was at the uh, conversation we had with a group of us that right, one partner of the conversation included the deaths of people who were not born. Those need to be calculated, and that's not unintelligible, right?
right, once you start counting, um, you know, sort of bodies all over Southeast Asia, right? But it's, but again, it, it's, it's all about a calculation that is serving to try to override some really valuable moral prohibition, which is we don't punish people who are not party to certain wrongs, right? I mean, that, that, that's the commitment of not merely like classical morality, but right, more particularly the Christian tradition. We don't harm people who are not involved in doing harms to other people or harms to us. Um, so I, I think that that's part of what you're, you're trying to yeah, drive at, right? But how do we just stop this calculation and, you know, can this be included as well? Yeah, that, that, that's uh, far better stated. I mean, I guess, uh, you know, and I'll, I won't defend this, but if we want to talk about it over yeah, yeah. or something, yeah. that'll be fine. This this idea of not doing harm to people who don't deserve it, like in, in some of us, harm you, we haven't harmed you. We haven't harmed you. We can whittle those numbers down in Hiroshima, right? It was twenty thousand soldiers that died. We could do all that. We could talk about the Tetsuko and how many were universally conscripted. At the end of the day, there were still babies and infirm and elderly that had no opportunity and no capability of fighting us. So we still have to account for them. Uh, so I don't, I don't want to be one of those who says, oh, you know, you know, the whole military target thing. Um, at the end of the day, um, you know, I wrote about this in a, in a piece on Afghanistan today, that when enough people have made enough bad decisions that pile up one upon the other, at some point there are no good decisions, purely good decisions that can be made. Um, the surrender should have happened months prior to the atomic bombing. Um, and, and then we wouldn't have dropped this bomb, no matter you know, what the inertia was. Had they stood down, we would have said, oh, ha ha, we're gonna drop it anyway, to see if the damn thing works. We wouldn't have done that, right? Um, in August of 1945, we had clusters of innocent people um, who, maybe through no fault of their own, were in conflict. Innocent people in China, innocent American conscripts, potentially about to invade Japan, innocent Japanese in Japan. Not all of these innocent people are going to survive to the end of August 1945. I think we have cause for preferring the lives of other innocent people to the lives of those innocent Japanese because we were forced to make that kind of preferential judgment. And that's ghastly and horrific and a source of grief, but it is not a source of moral pain. I think okay. the same thing is in things like ectopic pregnancy. How many questions do we have left? One. Will that be our final question? Go ahead. Mark. Mark, for you, in your decision calculus, it sounds like you're necessarily saying we expect the Japanese leadership to surrender based on inclusively these deaths of civilians versus just like trying to bomb somewhere that has less civilians or make some type of demonstration of power, etc. So, do I understand it right that that's a necess that's a part of your argument? Like we, we, for example, we didn't want to target some other location that didn't have as many people because we believed that they would not make a decision to surrender based on a lower amount of them. Uh, so there's two ways that I could answer that. I'll just try to get in the heads of the people with 1945. Um, with what I have read, and anybody can correct me if obviously we're on this, I don't know that that calculation played a role. For sure, people were saying, oh look, um, we could bomb the island of Truk. It's a purely military you know, target, let's do that. Let's blow the top of Mount, off of Mount Fiji. Like, there, there were arguments for a demonstration blast. Some of the reasons they said no to the demonstration blast you know, were very specific to the location. Richard Frank talked about the, the deep harbor at Truk, and that if we missed, if the bomb missed its mark, it would have fallen into the deep water, not detonated, not broken. The Japanese could have grabbed it. They could have perfected the bomb. Now they have the bomb. Um, the truck is, you know, far away from, not far away, but it's further away from Japan than Hiroshima is. Um, the ability of the Japanese to absorb exactly what happened on the truck is, is diminished. Uh, if you drop the bomb in Japan itself, uh, you know, they, they can feel the weight of what's just transpired more purely. It's just a better demonstration. Um, if we drop it on Mount Fiji or an unpopulated place, might that suggest to the Japanese that, aha, 
So the Americans have the bomb, which they deny forever. Um, okay, they have the bomb, but they don't have the will to use the bomb on a populated center. And so there were all these factors that did go into it. So I don't know if at any point they said, we got to bomb some people. But they did say, look, any of these other possibilities don't make sense. Um, they're too risky. Um, they might give false impressions. Um, in fact, the language of the Potsdam Declaration uh, were softened in certain areas. And we now have records of meetings of the Big Six where they said, oh, look, the Americans are weakening. Right? So it seemed that anything we did carried the risk, risks of being misinterpreted as being soft. Um, Hiroshima did not. But, but what that all makes clear, right, is that you know that you're treating the risks of missing, right, you know, something and having the bomb detonate underwater. Right? You're treating you're treating that risk as almost commensurable, right, if not completely commensurable, with the risks of killing innocent people. Right? It's all just getting factored into, right? An analysis, a calculation um, that's treating the lot, the deaths, the intentional deaths of innocent people as just, you know, an element of a calculation that's no different from, you know, maybe not having the bomb blow, you know, blow up the way you want it to, maybe not having the impact you want it to have, and so on. And that's exactly what, uh, again, the classical just war theory would say is inappropriate, immoral, right, is murderous. Um, we're not supposed to treat that as just another thing that can be factored into an analysis. Uh, and and the, one of the things I think that you see from a, an analysis like Marx is that it becomes, like you know, in the conversation I had earlier, a kind of deterministic one, right, that I think you use the language of, you know, the, the choices just sort of reduce to, well, we have to do this, right? So it's tragic, right? It's horrific, right? But it's determined. We have to do it. Um, and, and not to do it, right? I, I, think, I think you began by saying, right, would be the wrong thing. Right. right? right. It would be the wrong thing. Isn't that for most moral decisions, though? Like mm -hmm. deciding to go to war is, 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 mm -hmm. you, is the last resort versus you're already ruling out all these other possibilities. You're making that decision. You're saying not war is less ethical. Look, I, I, I want to end at least my bit with, with making very clear that I do not want to argue that the Americans felt that we were our hands were tied. Um, we did not make a constrained decision. We made a free decision, which means it was a moral decision. We could make that so wrongly. We could make it rightly. That's true. Um, but it was a, a you know morality requires the freedom to choose. We made a moral choice. I think we made the right one. Um, set against the costs of not making the choice we made, which wasn't simply utility, but it, it was you know the ghastly numbers of other innocent people that that were dying every day. So that's that's it. It was absolutely immoral. Right. Free so choice free, right, right, and, right, and by right, right and by right the analysis that right that I think animates the just war tradition, the free choice to kill innocent people right, intentionally and therefore save other innocent people remains murderous. It remains murderous. And ectopic pregnancies and murder and all that. On and on and on. Here we go. All right. We need to go to politics. <laughs> <laughs> Both of you say at least a few words on uh, 75 years, 76 years of peace since 1945, the, the exceptional nature of the relationship between Japan and the U.S. given the history before 1945. The moment when Obama all criticisms understood, embraced the survivor of Hiroshima, um, demonstrates to me that the aim of peace with the Japanese was a great good, and that the occupation was done well. Um, and it is, a, it is, and I mean this literally, this is not me cursing, it is a goddamn shame that we're not gonna have that moment with the Taliban in 75 years, right? So um, that was a great moment where the, where the victor was able to go into a defeated city and embrace a former enemy as friends. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a great grief that we do not enjoy those moments post-war very often. Peace is a great good. Um, of course, as we know, as Christians, the peace that we have is always imperfect. Um, and uh, you know, we, we hope that it's sustained. And, uh, you know, it, there's, a lot, uh, there's a lot we don't know 
why we become peaceful with people and why we don't. Um, and, and that's where we also have to thank providence, in, a sense, you know, in essence, right, as, again, as Christians, that there are things operating here that exceed our capacity to control. And that's part of what is built, you know, is baked into this analysis, too, that we don't know the outcomes of many of our actions. Uh, and we should be grateful You mean God's providence, not the negative? Uh, oh, listen, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, right now, you know, I'm open. So, uh, well, thank you all for uh, participating in this uh, very instructive conversation, especially uh, our distinguished uh, speakers. We'll post the video online as quickly as uh, Kennedy can uh, do so for us. So look forward to that. Uh, we are planning an event for um, commemorating 9-11, which will probably take place on 9-9 uh, or 9-10. So stay tuned for that event. And I'm also thinking we need to do something on Afghanistan, possibly next week, possibly next Thursday. So stay tuned for that announcement uh, as well. Please stick around for what's dropped your food and drink. So again, thank you so much.